Okay, great. Well, hi. Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is part of OCTO. Um, and we also have Nick Weiner uh, from OCTO on with us helping with today's webinar. And we're very excited to have Harold Wormelink from Breda University of the Netherlands on to talk about MSP Challenge, exploring the complexity of marine maritime spatial planning in a multiplayer simulation uh, game. Uh, and we're very, I'm really very excited to have Harold on because I've been wanting uh, to see a demo of of MSP Challenge for a long time. So we're, we're really glad he was uh, able to make it. Um, and we're very glad all of you are able to make it. It's kind of a crazy time. So um, uh, we hope you are, uh, are able to enjoy the webinar as, and keep furthering your work through, through learning during online on this, at this time. Um, before we get started, before I turn it over to Harold, I just wanted to let everyone know uh, we highly encourage you to ask questions during the webinar. Um, we'll, we'll have Harold's presentation, which will include some live demonstration of MSP Challenge. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have a time set aside for Q&A at the end. But go ahead and send your questions throughout. You can, we encourage you to send them to the Q&A uh, option in Zoom. And, uh, but you could also use the chat. Now with the chat, you do have the, uh, the ability to chat with all attendees. And if you have something to share about um, that's relevant to the discussion, we highly encourage you to go ahead and share it. Um, uh, just please use it respectfully um, because it does go out, it does have the option of going out to everyone. Okay, well, thank you everyone. And I'll turn it over to you, Harold. All right, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Um, well, I, I'm going to say good afternoon. Uh, I'm in the Netherlands. It's uh, just after 5 p.m. here. Uh, beautiful, sunny Netherlands at the moment uh, from home. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Sarah, and everyone at uh, the Skimmer. Um, it's great to, to demo and uh, tell you more about MSB Challenge, the simulation platform in particular, all about marine or maritime spatial planning. Uh, before I get into all the nitty gritty of what I'll be um, um, telling and demoing this afternoon, uh, a little bit more about me, I guess, would be nice. Um, yeah, so here's a boom, me in your face, Harold Warnlink. Um, super excited, uh, R&D project leader at Breda University of Applied Sciences. A uh, small university, medium-sized university in the south of the Netherlands, uh, working for the Academy for Games and Media. It's a good thing I didn't switch on my webcam, right? I'm working on serious and simulation game design, development, and application uh, for all sorts of challenges in public administration, organization, and management. And I got my PhD in the social scientific games research from Delft University of Technology. Uh, about seven years ago. So that's just a little bit about me. I've been working on MSP Challenge now for about four years, just under four years. Um, yeah, it's, and it's taking up a lot of my time, which, uh, which is absolutely no problem at all because it's very nice to work on this, uh, this project. So a little bit more about how I'm gonna do this. I'll start with a brief presentation about MSP in general and the EU just for those who don't really know that much about it, perhaps. Uh, I'll then go through, uh, quickly through the history of the MSP Challenge and the latest simulation platform of MSP Challenge. And I'll demo that, uh, specifically the North Sea edition of uh, MSP Challenge, which means I'll be showing you how to use different static uh, GIS data and dynamic simulated data that's contained in the software. Uh, to actually draw up spatial plans. I'll give you an example of an offshore wind farm and then simulating the spatial plans consequences on levels of energy, shipping and ecosystem. And how you can all try all of this uh, and more yourself. Um, so that's the main demo. Then of course we'll have ample time for Q&A. All right, then let's start um, at the beginning and uh, yeah, briefly go into MSP in general and within the EU. So MSP, marine spatial planning or maritime spatial planning um, is a hot topic within the EU. 
And luckily, there's all sorts of material you can find to get a brief introduction into it. This video, is, I highly recommend. You see the link there at the bottom of your screen. Um, you might want to take a screenshot of this or something uh, to visit that link on Vimeo. It's a great short movie, um, animated movie a clip in which you get a really nice general idea of what uh, MSP is. Um, we didn't develop it, by the way. We're very uh, uh, thankful that the University of Liverpool and their partners made this uh, movie we've worked with in different projects. Basically, it's about uh, balancing uh, the protection and use of the sea. Uh, so protecting the marine environment um, and making sure society benefits society in the broadest sense of the word, as you can also see uh, at the top of this, uh, is this nice still of the movie. Uh, shipping, uh, oil and gas energy, also renewable energy, um, uh, fishing, all sorts of stakeholders uh, involved, of course, in actually uh, the use of the sea besides protecting it. And marine spatial planning is really very much about a process and an outcome to make sure that those two are balanced. Um, you might be familiar also with this uh, diagram. I won't go in detail through it. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see on the right there, uh, a main diagram from a report on the step-by-step -step approach towards uh, ecosystem-based management in the form of marine spatial planning. And all I want to say about this diagram is that it's actually, yeah, it's, it's really uh, in a quite detailed level explains how you can go step-by-step, -step, obviously, from yeah, getting a mandate uh, to do maritime spatial planning within, typically within a national government um, and setting up an organization there to actually start doing it first by pre-planning. Uh, so I'd like to explain that as planning the planning. Um, there, after really getting into what are the existing uh, conditions there, what's the status quo of the sea in question, before analyzing, okay, where do we want to be in 10 years time, for instance, and then going through an actual process of drafting different versions, uh, more detailed as you go along of an actual spatial plan um, and before you actually formally politically approve it and afterwards implement it, which is of course the point where MSP stops. And as this diagram also indicates, uh, stakeholder involvement is, is very important to MSP and uh, goes through, uh, through all, uh, all these different uh, stages of the process. Um, just to show you some examples of the different ways um, MSPs can be depicted. Uh, these, of course, aren't the official and full MSPs of uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, of course, there's always a, a heavy policy document involved in it as well, but basically it's, of course, a, a map. Uh, on the left there, you see the Netherlands with their exclusive economic zone in the North Sea, uh, quite a, a big one. It's bigger than the country itself. And um, yeah, what you can see there is lots of space, obviously, for uh, shipping routes, uh, marine protection, and all the black dots, I'm sure you could guess, are oil and gas platforms in the North Sea. And of course, you also have lots of other uses there. And I, you might be able to see some uh, thin white lines everywhere. Those, those are cables and pipelines. And um, the little red dots, uh, dollops, if you will, here and there are offshore wind farms that are already uh, being built or operational. On the right, you have the Belgium, uh, a Belgium, Belgian example. It's not the official maritime spatial plan again, and this one is already a bit older. Uh, they've actually gone into a new round of maritime spatial planning already, and this is a much smaller area in the North Sea, obviously. Just to give you a sense of what does it look like. Now, why is this all such a hot topic in the European Union? Why is this all um, happening? Well, basically, a key factor here is the uh, MSP directive. Now, for those of you who don't know, the European Union actually works through directives and when it comes to uh, establishing new laws, uh, directives that obligate the member states to actually implement 
certain laws in their national uh, frameworks or national laws. And the MSP Directive of 2014 um, established a framework for MSP in the entire European Union. It obligated all the member states to actually establish this process and uh, get to a plan or plans by 2021, so next year already. Of course, many countries uh, were already uh, at it um, when it came to MSP right before that um, and, and since the directive as well. Some countries are still not done yet. So yeah, some countries are, are quite in the crunch, if you want to put it like that. And what it, um, yeah, what the directive stipulates is that, yeah, you really, the member states need, really need to approach it uh, in an integrated manner. All spatial uses and possible conflicts of the sea in question really need to be in there. Um, the plan needs to be evidence-based, really best available knowledge uh, needs to be, uh, Underpinning it, it also needs to be ecosystem based. So it has to start and end, you could say, with the ecosystem. Really uh, monitor the cumulative impact of uh, human activities on the marine ecology. It has to be transboundary, meaning that it's, it has to, um, uh, in the end, uh, concern the sea basin level, even though, you, uh, of course, the countries have control over their own economic zones only, they do have to coordinate between them and get to a proper plan on the sea basin level, consult each other, coordinate with each other. And of course, they have to inform the general public and consult all relevant stakeholders. So this is a massive challenge, isn't it? I mean, try to imagine it. Um, uh, you've got this European sea basins, uh, a patchwork of economic zones there, uh, crossing borders also with non-EU countries, obviously, right? Uh, lots of transboundary national and sectoral interests where one country's uh, solution or sector solution or stakeholder solution is another one's problem. And you do have to try to achieve synergy by cooperating. And yeah, just to reiterate the massive skill there, of course, this, this, di this picture isn't completely accurate, but the blue area there does roughly represent the entire area that needs to have an MSP in place in terms of process and outcome by next year. And as I mentioned, not all countries are, are done yet. So yeah, um, at this point, I'm gonna shift towards, okay, so where does MSP challenge come in? Basically, this all MSP challenge all started already nine years ago. 2011, um, uh, Lodewijk Afspoel of the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and the Environment in the Netherlands, together with Xander Kaiser, um, approached Igor Meyer, the professor I'm working for at the Bayer University of Applied Sciences, with this idea of, okay, can't we develop a simulation game to help people understand this topic of MSP, um, learn by doing. Uh, and, and they're not, of course, stu just students, uh, also yeah, policy makers, uh, public administrators, people who have to step into this new world of MSP. And they did, they, ma they made a first, first version and it was applied at a big workshop in Lisbon with lots of success, which led slowly led to the development of uh, a bigger version of the game, 2013. And by 2016, there was sufficient interest also in a board game. Of course, there's lots of great uh, advantages to having a board game as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Lots of simulation games start out as a board game before they become a digital game. Here, it's the other way around. It started as a digital game and later also became a board game. But just before that, actually, before we developed the board game, or I should say Igor Alexander and Lodewijk developed the board game, um, a team at Breda University of Applied Sciences got the chance, got the funding to start developing this latest version, the simulation platform in 2015, towards the end of the year there. And that led to um, yeah, three different editions. So this is really a simulation platform, as you will see in a moment that can host multiple sea basins. And we have first developed three, 
uh, the North Sea edition, the Baltic Sea edition, and the Clyde Marine Region edition. So at the moment we have these three sea basins. The Clyde Marine Region is, is yeah, is, is more of an estuary, the river estuary of the Clyde in northwest Scotland near Glasgow. So yeah, we have lots and lots of funders and partners to thank for the development of the simulation platform, as this slide uh, shows. Uh, lots of funding of the European Union went in through different programs, and we're very grateful for that, because without it, would have wouldn't have been possible. But what is it? <laughs> it's basically before I actually show it. Of course, it's the best way to to, to do it. Uh, it's basically now a game-based platform for collaborative learning of stakeholders and planners or anyone else for that matter, of course, to support real-world integrated ecosystem-based MSP. We're really trying to use state-of-the-art game technology, integrate real geographical data through GIS systems, um, GIS, I should say, of course. EcoPath with EcoSim is also connected to this. I'm sure some, uh, some of you out there are familiar with EcoPath with EcoSim. It's a great open-source ecosystem modeling software um, uh, yeah, we're we, well, we have interconnected MSP Challenge with it, with lots of benefits. Um, and we also created separate shipping and energy simulators attached to this platform, which I'll demo. We started working on a prototype for a virtual reality module, as the screenshot in the bottom right corner there shows, to make it a bit more 3D, a bit more insightful. Um, what is it actually you are planning? Uh, something we're, we're still working on uh, and hope to release uh, in the future as well. It offers lots of scenario options. Uh, so you can set different player goals. You can control the time of the simulation. You can pause it to just make give people enough uh, time to, to plan or actually just to kickstart the, the process by just uh, clicking on play to start the simulation it's running in the background already. And you can enhance it with role playing, uh, not necessarily within the software itself. You can also do that, of course, outside of the software, as I'll, I'll explain in, in a minute as well. In short, it's quite expandable and adaptable. Uh, we really wanted to create a platform that can host different sea basins, um, integrate different real geographical data, um, uh, yeah, uh, connect it to simulations to show possible consequences of the spatial plans that you're making there. And um, yeah, allow people to, to learn what MSP really is. Now, uh, just to, to explain a little bit, how have we applied it so far? Uh, well, this is a nice photograph of a typical session we've done. We've done uh, since January 2018, 25 of these. Uh, well, roughly uh, like this, of course, every time it's a little different with in total uh, just over 350 people already uh, in 15 different countries, mostly the Netherlands, Germany, and UK. So typically we, we, we divide a, a bigger group of people over different countries, uh, smaller groups of two, three people, each representing a country around the sea basin in question, in this case, the North Sea. And we ask them to represent that country and develop spatial plans. Now they're all connected to the same server. So all these four laptops that you see in this photograph, they're all on the same North Sea, virtual North Sea, uh, which means all the plans they all develop are integrated uh, together and um, uh, to, to, to become one big North Sea plan, if you will. And then the simulations pick up on those together to show you what are the combined consequences of all these plans on on shipping, energy, and the ecosystem. So just this is all to give you a, an idea of, of all, yeah, how have we uh, used this. It's high time to give you a demo. So I'm going to switch over here. And um, yeah, this is, of course, the, the point where things uh, might go wrong. I hope not. Uh, everything looks good. I'm going to move over the game here, and I'm going to Increase the size of the interface and maximize it. All right, I think, yeah, I think we're all there. I'm, I'm assuming you can all see this. <laughs> I'm sure I'll hear it from Sarah if something is wrong. Um, but here it is, the North Sea edition of MSP Challenge. 
Now, basically, um, um, yeah, this is uh, the software that one of the groups in, in a session uh, would be looking at. So everyone has this interface, basically. I'm logged on now to our uh, online demo server, um, which everyone can try. Uh, you just uh, go to the MSP Challenge website where you can download the software and then you can connect to our uh, demo server to uh, try this out yourself as well at some point if, if you want. Um, so what do we have here? Well, uh, I have a nice map obviously of the North Sea that I can pan over and zoom in out of there. And um, I've got lots of options, obviously. I've got lots of data layers up here in the top left corner underneath all these buttons data layers on all sorts of things like typical governance things also environmental conditions some wind speed data layers for instance uh, which is based on uh, which is raster data based on the copernicus uh, program of the european union on the right here i can see a legend for that one just to help us uh, help us interpret uh, the different uh, colors. I think I'll increase the size a little bit. So it's a bit easier probably for everyone to see what I'm doing. All right. Um, well, so I've got dozens of data layers to begin with, right? I won't go through all of them because that'll take forever. Uh, but yeah, to begin with, we've got lots of data layers on all sorts of things, also on shipping, for instance, IMO routes, those are down here, the International Maritime Organization's routes. Uh, this is, of course, a very, very busy uh, um, uh, area of shipping. So the IMO, based in London, by the way, uh, have instigated some routes here to make sure the traffic flows smoothly. Uh, we've also got, uh, of course, wind farms in here. So these, oh, I should uh, put on this one first. These are wind farms uh, that we could get in terms of data and that are currently or recently were developed. I'm sure it's uh, already probably out of date. Things are going really fast when it comes to wind farms at the moment. Here are some search areas. So these are known areas, announced areas in which different countries um, at which different countries are looking at for development of wind farms in the North Sea. So here we have, for instance, for the Dutch people out there, a huge area that's going to be considered, I think it's already decided actually that this is going to be uh, developed in chunks. Uh, you might also notice the, this, these, this areas, these areas over here in Germany, uh, quite a lot of wind farm areas are being considered here. Uh, what's also nice to show you here is that, of course, I mentioned the, uh, yeah, the layers I'm showing right now are, are layers, uh, static layers from geographical information systems. Uh, but we also have simulated data. As I mentioned, we've got three simulations running, running in the background uh, on shipping, energy and the ecosystem. So uh, I'll show you what the shipping does, the shipping simulator. So based on these areas, uh, but also, so the IMO routes, also uh, national shipping lanes, for instance, uh, no shipping zones, uh, the actual ports that are out there, um, and also anchorages, uh, maybe some precautionary areas. No, not in this edition. They basically form the basis for our shipping simulation that uh, has a look at all of this, and based on the amount of traffic that we define in the simulator of, of actual ships that want to go from port to port in and out of this region, uh, it generates uh, paths, paths that these ships tend to take to generate a heat map. We like to call this a heat map. It's, uh, the shipping simulator is not about uh, high accuracy. It's about general ideas, general ideas of where we can find shipping traffic. It's also very lightweight, so high realism of the shipping simulation is not what we're going for at present to make sure everything can run smoothly and quickly on different machines. But here, the nice thing about this uh, pathfinding uh, shipping simulator is that it's responsive, right? It's dynamic. So if someone were to draw plans, 
that's in the way of, uh, of existing ships, yeah, the shipping simulator would respond and go around those plans. So I can show you that uh, later as well. Now, of course, many of you, I'm sure, are much more interested in the ecosystem simulation. Now, this works through pressures. So we've got lots of uh, pressures in the simulator generated by the different human activities, things like noise, the noise pressure layer. Now, you can imagine, I think you can imagine what all this noise is coming from. If I activate another data layer, you'll get it confirmed. Uh, I actually go here. The oil and gas installations all over the North Sea there, in case you were wondering why this area is so, um, uh, why, well, why we are so well off in terms of the economy. Uh, lots of oil and gas have been uh, developed here uh, over the past decades. But it generates lots of noise. Uh, and we've got other, uh, some other um, pressures in here as well, things like artificial substrate. I'm sure you can also imagine that cables and pipelines create those bottom disturbance, surface disturbance, also created by ships, of course. Now these pressures, as well as fishing, which is another kind of pressure here. So we've got different fishing fleets here, for instance, industrial and pelagic trawlers. Heat maps again, these kinds of pressures are fed into the ecosystem simulation, which then responds by creating more heat maps of where the species actually end up. So here you see a heat map of the cod. And let me just show you the uh, legend for that one here. So obviously the, the, the more green and red the color, the higher the density of cod here. So this is the EcoPath with EcoSim simulation uh, attached to the platform. This is generated by the EcoPath with EcoSim simulation, these kinds of heat maps based on the pressures that we in, in, introduce um, as, as uh, players in the game. Uh, the, the simulation of ecosystem generates the results of, um, uh, of these uh, species heat maps, different heat maps here of the species that you can cycle through to understand where can we find what species. Now, for those of you who are totally into ecosystem modeling, uh, obviously this is uh, simplified. Uh, there are many more species and species groups to simulate, obviously many more pressures to simulate, uh, to make things more realistic. Uh, but of course, yeah, at some point, uh, it, this is already a, quite an information overload. So we do try to trim things down to make it a bit more manageable in a game session. But of course, it's, again, the simulation platform is flexible. So yeah, the nice thing about it is that if there is interest in, in getting a session together, uh, getting, getting a game together, an addition together with lots more data layers, uh, lots more realism in it, yeah, we're ready to support that. Uh, so that's nice uh, about this flexible platform. Now, of course, it's not all just about data layers, it's about planning. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to start by clicking on this big plus up here and uh, yeah, providing a name for our new plan, which is going to be a wind farm. Now I can select the wind farm data layer that we want to draw with uh, over here. That automatically also adds the energy cables. And I'll also add landing stations over here. So those are the points, uh, landfall points, if you, some people call them as well, point where the cables uh, reach land, the energy cables. And just because I want to consider moving shipping routes in favor of this wind farm, and maybe even decommissioning uh, an oil and or gas installation, I'm gonna add those as well. So as you can see in this interface, yeah, you can make a plan uh, as, as, yeah, as complicated or, or easy as you want. You can involve just one data layer or a whole bunch of data layers. And you can go through this wizard many, many, many more times. Now this simulation is time-based. I'm not sure you can all see that. I have this uh, interface up here. Oh, I can move that around, of course I can. 
oh, why didn't I do that before? Okay, so uh, up here you see we are now in March 2020 in our simulated time. And time is actually running, just uh, flipped over to April there. So this is time-based. I have to think, uh, when do I want and can I actually get this plan implemented? Well, let's say 23. Yeah. So we're ready to get started. This opens up a little plans monitor up here and I can expand. And uh, as an administrator, I can actually see if there's other people also uh, drawing up plans. But here is my plan, the WIP file. I, I can close it for now. I don't need it right now. Uh, so I've now activated my plans, which mean my, my plan, which means I'm in viewing mode uh, 2030 because that's my implementation date, right? So I can start editing. What do I want the world to look like in 2030? Well, I want my wind farm and I want it over here. So we have here in the center, I'm sure you've noticed already, a light colored area. Yeah, that, the, the base data layer that's activated is bathymetry, so the depth of the sea which means the lightly colored area is a shallow area. For those of you who don't know, this is called the Dogger Bank. Dogger Bank is a shallow area right in the middle of the North Sea. That's a very interesting area, uh, precisely because of uh, wind farms. Uh, shallow areas are very interesting for wind farm development. So let's assume I'm playing on behalf of Country Red, England, and I'm going to zoom in over here. I'm going to start creating a huge wind farm. Why not? Uh, I'm clicking on create and I'm pointing, placing points like so. It's just single clicking, placing points. So I'm going to, I'm going to take over this entire dollar bank and create a humongous wind farm. Why not? Well, there's lots of reasons why not, but it's a game, right? So we can try things. Oh, this, this would be a huge wind farm, I can tell you. 73 gigawatts is huge. Now, uh, of course, when, when I want to accept this, I have to consider other things like, oh, shipping routes, right? Shipping routes are in the way, are they? Let's have a look. Ah, yes, there is a shipping route in the way. Oh, there's more red exclamation marks, right? Oil and gas installations. Well, for the sake of time, I'll keep it easy. And I'll just edit this, make it a bit smaller. I'll just move it over, move these points over, thereby decreasing the size. I'll do it a little, little bit more, make it a bit easier. I'm sure this would solve it. Does it? Do I still have issues? I don't have issues. Well, maybe I have issues, but this plan doesn't have issues. Great, so now I can accept it. So I've created a nice uh, huge wind farm here that isn't in the way of anything. It's in shallow waters. This might actually be feasible. I don't know, I'm not an expert. Now before uh, I can just watch to see what the consequences of this plan are, I do need to get it approved. So this is also where the multiplayer functionality of the software comes in. Of course, you have to uh, have recall that typically in a, in, a, in a session, we have multiple people logged on to the same North Sea in this case, all planning. So we, we built in sort of a process flow in this system where you can first, for instance, say, oh, I want to open this up for consultation of the other players so they can actually see it and tell me what they think of it. Uh, you might also want to create a plan that uh, crosses borders uh, in which case you'll need actual approval from the people involved. Uh, but in this case, you know, I've stuck to England, one country, I'm playing as England, so I can approve it. And uh, this means uh, by the time the simulation reaches 2030, May 2030, this will actually be implemented and the simulations will respond. Now that'll take a while, uh, so I'm skipping that. And instead I'm showing you uh, some slides of what the consequences of this particular plan would be. So let me go back to my uh, presentation here and show you, and then we are ready for questions. So I, yeah, go back here. So what we tend to do in sessions, which is my favorite moment of the session, if I'm uh, completely honest, it's, it's, uh, it's towards the end of a typical game session, is we do before and after pictures. So 
for instance. In this case, that would look like this. I have a before of shipping intensity. So this is shipping intensity uh, at the beginning of the game uh, when no one has planned anything yet. And then I went ahead and planned my wind farm, which led to this. Now I'll, I'll cycle uh, a little bit between uh, those again, just in case you missed it. Have a good look at your screen. This is the before. And this is the after. So I'm sure you noticed some differences there, particularly this big red line over here. What's that about? Well, our shipping simulation has noticed, okay, you've got a big wind farm over there and they need to be maintained. The, the wind farm needs to be maintained. So that generates lots of maintenance traffic and it's coming from that port over there. But you also notice that this ship traffic going through here is actually going now over there. So these are just some impacts of this one big wind farm alone. Imagine a big group of people developing lots of plans all over the place, how, how the before and after would look differently then. That's often a very nice moment, of course, in the session. Now, of course, a change in the ship, uh, ship traffic or the, the location of ship traffic means also a change in noise, right? So here's the noise before and here's the noise after. Now, of course, what you notice here is not so much a change in noise because of ship traffic, but of course a change in noise because of the actual wind farm itself, right? Including the maintenance traffic going to it right there. Artificial substrates, another one to do, nice one to do a before and after with. So here's the before for artificial substrates. So, right, so artificial uh, um, uh, habitat, if you will, um, on the sea floor there or in the water column. And this is after we developed our wind farm there. Uh, in my uh, in preparations of this, uh, I, uh, of this um, uh, webinar, I actually also drew a cable, which I didn't do just now, a cable between uh, the wind farm and a landfall point over there. And that's also now showing on this map, as you can see here, before and after. Yeah, of course, there's more impacts also uh, on the level of uh, fishing. So here's the industrial and pelagic trawlers, a typical uh, or a, a specific fishing fleets that we modeled through Ecopath with Ecosim. Here's the before of uh, a heat map. Where are these uh, fishing fleets actually fishing? And here's the after. Notice the big gap, of course, because of the wind farm. Uh, that's because these aren't, uh, these fishing fleets aren't allowed in wind farms, at least uh, not at present, and generally not at present in, uh, in the European Union. It's too dangerous. So yeah, by developing wind farms, you're also limiting fishing grounds. Now let's see if that did anything to the species itself, right? So let's see the key species that we put in here, or well, key in, sense, in the sense of of course, all species are key species, but in the sense of uh, economically key species, where we can talk about herring, for instance, of course, very well known uh, in the Netherlands, a delicacy. I don't like them to eat them, I mean. But here's herring before and here's herring after. Now you can see that they're actually drawn away from that wind farm area, mostly because of the, uh, the noise involved, probably, I would say. So yeah, this is just a brief example of how we can do before and after with the different simulations there to show some of the consequences of a spatial plan. Now again, try to imagine a group of people, like 20 people, uh, logged on to five or six or seven uh, laptops, all drawing on behalf of uh, well, the six main countries you see here, for instance, drawing up spatial plans all over the place and imagine how the simulations uh, responses would be there and how you, you would have a, a wealth of uh, input for further analysis about what actually happened with all these marine spatial plans. So there you have it, a little demo. Um, just to wrap up and then we can go to questions. 
Um, MSP Challenge is free and open source software, even though we haven't released the source code yet because it's not completely finished yet. It, it will be, I promise, and it's free already. Uh, you can try it out yourself using our online demo servers. I mentioned that earlier. Just go to mspchallenge.info. You'll need to create an account and then you can uh, download the software. Uh, we hope to release the entire platform, meaning also the server software, uh, as well as the source code later this year. And with that, I say thank you, and uh, it's time for a q and A. I'm sure there are questions about the platform or MSP in the North Sea or anything else. And uh, even if you don't get a chance uh, to get your question answered here, um, yeah, I'm more than willing to, uh, to respond afterwards. Just send me an email, and I'm sure I can help you. Sarah. Sure. Oh, thank you so much, Harold. That was a great presentation. And uh, we really appreciate you being here to give it. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot of, of, of really good questions already. So uh, we'll just sort of hit it and uh, just start in. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, again, you can send them into the Q&A uh, or, the, or the chat. So um, one question that's come up in several iterations is where is the tool available for? What regions? and yeah, uh, so if you could talk about like, is it customizable re relatively easily for another region that it does, doesn't currently exist for, et cetera? Well, um, I can show you the, the website. If now, uh, maybe now I should just uh, briefly explain. So basically we have three editions, right? So we have three regions, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Clyde Marine region in the Northwest of Scotland there. Those three um, are available. The Clyde, we're still wrapping up. So uh, yeah, there's still some nitty gritty things there, but uh, already you can demo the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Now in terms of creating other editions, yeah, because we integrate real geographical uh, geodata from geographical information systems, it's not you know, click around a couple of times in the Hey Presto, you've got your new edition not just because of the geo data, but also because of the connected simulations. The, those simulations are specific to the regions in question. So it's not easy at present to create a new edition. And it's a huge uh, innovation challenge to get to that level. We do, however, uh, support it. And uh, we have tools in place to do it. And you can find uh, more information on the community wiki that we created. So if you go to mspchallenge.info and click through, you'll uh, uh, yeah, quite quickly end up on community.mspchallenge.info, which is a wiki. And um, there's lots of pages on there about uh, using the platform, getting the platform, um, and actually uh, setting up your own edition. It's quite technical still but at least uh, we've got the tools in place to support it and we're looking forward to, to working on that with you. Okay, thank you, Harold. Um, <clears throat> question, I understood the main value of the MSP challenge game to be a communication and advocacy tool to help stakeholders and others to understand what MSP is about and how it could work in practice. Is that correct? Has it ever been used for real, in quotation marks, by those mm -hmm. undertaking a planning process to prepare an actual marine plan? Well, actually, since we uh, started applying the platform in January 2018, it's, it's, it's already been more than, than uh, used for, for communication and uh, uh, sort of uh, awareness raising, if you will. Uh, so most of our sessions that we've done, like the one I showed uh, in that photograph, uh, I'll put it up for a second, is actually with actual planners and stakeholders. So the people that you're seeing in this picture here are actually uh, planners, researchers, and stakeholders in the energy sector. Uh, and this was a session in Aberdeen, Scotland. So this was a, a Scotland-oriented session in the end, um, where we actually uh, wanted them to, as seriously as possible, uh, as realistically as possible, um, develop plans for offshore renewable energy. So uh, yes, it, indeed, it's always been and will always be about learning uh, and communication. What is it? Uh, how complex is it? Uh, how can we learn uh, more about that? But indeed, uh, the, yeah, there's a fine line between that and actual uh, usage in a formal MSP process. 
when yeah it's it's not so much as far as i know uh, it's not like planners are using it in an, in their daily practice uh, i'm pretty confident that's not the case yet um, but uh, through the different European Union projects, we did do lots of stakeholder engagement sessions like this one you're seeing right here. So we're getting close to that um, sort of planning support system level. Okay, thank you, Harold. Um, there's a question about whether it integrates marine debris at all. Oh, marine debris, that's great. No, at present, I have to be very clear, uh, not yet. But that would be super interesting, of course, and very relevant. Um, thinking about plastics, thinking about uh, containers. There was a huge accident uh, involving a container vessel not so long ago to the north of the Netherlands. And we're still struggling with the consequences of that. Um, yeah, actually planning for uh, uh, marine litter cleanup, ocean cleanup. Uh, I'm sure maritime spatial planners are at least considering that, so it's something we could pick up in MSP. In general, uh, when, when people come up with new ideas for related to this, like what about marine litter or what about some other aspect, some other human activity, or uh, the, the nice thing about the platform is that we can integrate uh, any data layer as long as it conforms to a GIS 10 standard. Uh, yeah, relatively easy. Again, uh, it's, it's still technical. So if there's, uh, for instance, a data layer about this, uh, perhaps based on satellite data, uh, Earth observation data, uh, or if there's uh, some kind of simulator uh, created about this, we can consider interconnecting it with MSP Challenge. Would be nice to, to do in the future. But at present, no. Okay, great. Thank you, Harold. Um, question, thanks for presenting the game. I wonder if you integrate budget issues, meaning do players have to take into account financial constraints? Yeah. Also, um, do you, oh, well, and yeah. also do you integrate financial revenues linked to sea development, a little like Farmville? <laughs> yeah, oh, I, uh, a part of me wishes we, we did. Uh, part of me is glad that we don't. Uh, <laughs> so the, the answer to the question is no. And there's no financials in the game uh, uh, yet. Uh, it is something that came up very early, of course, in the design process. Well, what about the financial aspects, the costs of certain things and the revenues of certain things? Um, we decided not to do anything with it as yet because this is a planning oriented uh, game. So our rationality there, our rationale there is if a government uh, uh, puts something high on the political agenda, such as offshore renewable energy development uh, at sea, then uh, a pl it's the planner's job to make sure there's space for that, uh, not so much whether there's money for that. Uh, so that's sort of the rationale there. It's something we could definitely do. It would sort of uh, introduce, at least uh, I would say, uh, it introduces a new level, of course, of gameplay. Uh, which, which to an extent is of course still uh, relevant also to maritime spatial planning. Uh, yeah, of course we can imagine that spatial planners are of course in the end also concerned about uh, costs and revenues to some extent, uh, but it would also sort of shift away from that a little, which could be fine, which could be very interesting. I mean, the, from a technological sense, by creating a platform in this manner, it opens up other possibilities than, than purely uh, where we put the boundaries around MSP. So it would be interesting to look into that. Okay, thank you, Harold. And we have a lot of questions um, pertaining to whether it's, it's applicable, which regions it's applicable for, and just sort of like, how much would it cost to develop and maintain this platform for another area? Like how many- Oh, that's a uh, super let's... hard question. It's really yes. hard. Yeah. Um, because it really depends on how big the area is, how much data is there already available from GIS, uh, are there simulations available. So if you, if you were to say, okay, I have a small area, uh, let's say a, a bay area, a bigger bay area around the city, not so much the North Sea or something like that. But let's, let's assume we have a small area, a bay area around the city, 
And yeah, uh, I, I, I don't have any uh, simulations, uh, but uh, at least I have some GIS data and I just want to offer this as a tool for, for students or, or stakeholders or planners to at least start drawing up plans using all that different data layers. We don't, we don't have any simulations, Harold. I'm so sorry, we don't have any simulations. Well, then it could be quite uh, quick and cheap, and cheap uh, let's say, call it that. Uh, to set up uh, an, an addition around that. But yeah, just to give you an indication, uh, to, to develop uh, the North Sea uh, as it is right now, it did take us, yeah, about a year. Of course, that was also because we were still developing the platform, so the actual uh, infrastructure and the code um, to support it. Now we don't have that anymore. We can just have the, all the tools available and we can start looking at creating a new addition. But yeah, don't expect this to be done within a week or something, whatever the, whatever the, the small area you're talking about. This is a matter of, of putting a team together to work together for a couple months to set it up, uh, do it right, uh, get the right data, connect to any simulation that you can find so you can at least get that uh, simulated effects out of it. So it's yeah, I can't give you exact numbers, but please don't think it's uh, it's just like that. Okay, all right, thank you, Harold. <laughs> um, oh, there's so many good questions. Um, let's see, does the system integrate ecosystem connectivity? Um, well, that depends on the model. So this is the nice thing of of, um, of the platform's architecture. So the EcoPath with EcoSim. Uh, um, simulator running in the background of the North Sea um, is, is a standalone application that's interconnected with MSP Challenge. This means we send the, the MSP Challenge game sends data to this uh, simulator. That simulator runs on its own, uh, com uh, uh, cracks, some cracks some numbers and then feeds back output to MSP Challenge again. Which means when it comes to connectivity of ecosystems uh, or, or with, for instance, marine protected areas and their influence there, it, it really just depends on how good the model is running in EcoPath with EcoSim. Uh, MSP Challenge in itself has nothing to do with it. Uh, so but the, yeah, the, that's the nice thing of this architecture. Um, as, as EcoPath with EcoSim on its own keeps developing and people keep using it to develop ecosystem models, uh, introducing all sorts of ecosystem modeling concepts like connectivity there. Uh, yeah, if, it's, if it runs an EcoPath with EcoSim and it feeds back, uh, it feeds the input from MSP Challenge, feeds back output to MSP Challenge, you'll get the benefits of that within MSP Challenge. So the North Sea model, as far as I know, I'm not an ecosystem modeler, as far as I know, there's quite some uh, aspects of ecosystem connectivity in there. Uh, I don't think if that's what the question is also about, when, you know, for instance, how certain areas um, are nurseries and then uh, species move over to another area as they mature. I don't think that's in the North Sea model yet. But it could be, uh, as I explained, it could be if someone updates the EcoPath with EcoSim model, uh, then yeah, uh, MSP Challenge can be used with that. Okay, thank you, Harold. And let's see, another question. Are you able to integrate data from coastal land to explore land sea dynamics that affect marine spatial plan? Planning. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, land sea interactions is the, is the concept used in the MSB directive in the European Union for that. Yeah, land sea interactions. It's a, so it's, it's a part of the MSB directive. Uh, thereby, it should also be in the game. At the moment, yeah, the, the, the way we can do it with this uh, architecture design, yeah, <clears throat> we would need to have some, that modeled somehow, right? So for instance, you would need uh, included, for instance, in the EcoPath with EcoSim model, or it could be a separate simulator, of course, but let's assume uh, you would use EcoPath with EcoSim with this. You could introduce uh, the outflow of nutrients or uh, waste or, or, or uh, whatever from uh, rivers into the sea. 
you could introduce that on that level. It's not in there yet, it's not in the model, but you could. Um, and of course, there's other things you could think about, uh, but when it comes to land-sea interactions. For instance, uh, not just on the ecosystem level, but also on the level of transportation. Uh, you know, we've got uh, a shipping simulator in there uh, that takes base data of the number of ships coming uh, and going from different ports. Uh, what if that changes because of a change in transportation infrastructure on land? Um, again, not in there yet, but uh, that would be very interesting to introduce. Okay, thank you again, Harold. Um, question, are the players able to join a player network and share learning and best practices and insights between different groups playing it from different locations around the world? Oh, what a great idea. Uh, I'm sure we haven't really set that up yet. We're only, uh, yeah, as, as, you, as you gathered from my presentation, we're only now getting ready to actually release the software. Uh, we've only just a month ago uh, finished or at least got a first version of that community wiki up and running. Uh, so I think, yeah, at least the community wiki is a, is a, could be a nice place for it where people can share learnings, right? The whole idea of a, of a wiki is that anyone who's uh, registered can create a page and um, uh, share their learnings there. We could also add some other features if there's sufficient interest for that. So ideally, I would say the community wiki under community.mspchallenge.info is the place for that or could be the place for that in the future. Um, right now, uh, yeah, the user base uh, in terms of, you know, outside of the sessions we've done that you see here on your screen, uh, the user base is still relatively small. So uh, it's not like we have uh, loads of people developing uh, all sorts of les lessons that they could share. So uh, it's a great idea. Uh, I'll think about it. And uh, if anyone has concrete uh, uh, suggestions on, on improving the community wiki to support that, uh, send me a note and um, we'll work on it. Okay, thank you, Harold. Um, one qu another question. So now that we're uh, many of us are socially distancing or quarantined, yeah. uh, what are the options for playing virtually with with dispersed groups? Yeah, uh, it's 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 supported out of the box, you could say. So we did a session purely online uh, just a couple of weeks ago with uh, students from St. Mary's University in uh, Halifax, uh, Canada, um, uh, which went really well. Uh, we're really happy that that, uh, that we could do that. So yeah, every, since it's a, a multiplayer networked game, uh, yeah, the, it's 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 built in that that idea. It's no problem. We can just do it. So typically, what it would be involved is that we would need to set up a, a server somewhere, um, and then just spread the client software to the end users who install it on their laptops, and then they can log on to that server and start playing. Okay, thank you. And we just have a time for a few quick questions. Um, are you able to compare the results of the game to the current um, MSFD goals of good environmental status? Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, the MSFD framework, uh, yeah, that's huge, of course. Um, I'm, I'm rallying my brain. Um, good environmental status, right? Um, we've been talking to quite some people about getting uh, really good indicators of the MSFD somehow into the game. Of course, uh, th there's been lots of work there on different levels of abstraction. Uh, and the more concrete they get, the better it is, the easier it is to implement in the game. So that is something we should look at. And, um, and right now there's no clear uh, MSFD indicator in the game, uh, as, as far as I know. Uh, maybe uh, there is a, an indicator uh, of integrated in MSFD that by chance is already actually in the game, but consciously designed into the game. We don't have, have the MSFD uh, indicators yet. I think we were talking with a couple of Italian partners who are interested in, uh, in, a, in addition around the Italian uh, seeds of integrating some of the MSFD indicators there. Something to pick up in the future again. So many great ideas, Sarah. Well, there's even more because we weren't able to get to, to 
quite a few of the questions. There's, there's more than twice mm -hmm. as we were able Brilliant. to answer. So yes. So thank you so much, Harold, for doing this. Um, this was fabulous. And that's, I was so glad to, to finally be able to do this. Um, awesome. We've been wanting to feature MSP Challenge for a while. So we really appreciate it. And we really appreciate everyone who's able to tune in today. Um, there's, uh, I believe the link to the recording was both posted in the chat and it's been sent to everyone. So um, please share that with anyone else who might be interested. All right. Well, all thank right. you, Harold. And thank you so much, Sarah. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>